Hi, Ninjas. Paul here again with Lee Joinson, our People Deck Ambassador. Hi, Lee. Hey, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. How are you? Oh, yeah, scraping through. It's all good. Good, good. good. Looks like you're back in the office. We are. It's very exciting. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. But, yeah, we had uh, uh, about three quarters of the team in yesterday. So really, really good. Nice to see some banter around the office once again. Great to hear. Great to hear. So, um, number six in our instalments, running through the uh, HR Tech Selector checklist that, that hopefully people have seen the PDF. Um, we're back on the right side of the checklist now, which is the getting your house in order. And um, we're going to be talking about um, data quality, data migration, cleansing, maybe even a bit of GDPR today. So, so a really important topic um, because uh, the old adage, right? Put crap in, get crap out. It's really important to get your uh, to get your house in order in terms of your data if you're looking at a new system, right? Yeah, absolutely right, Paul. Yeah. So um, as you say, it's it's about getting that data quality spot on so that you can build on that, uh, you know, end of the day, what most of our HR leadership are looking for are great quality insights and, you know, being able to understand how the business is growing and changing as, as things move along. And the foundations of that is getting your data right at the very start of the process. And we're going to talk about that in a bit of detail. Data quality and data cleansing are all to, uh, terms that really turn people on. So uh, I expect everyone will be really engaged as we go through this one. We, we should be, we'll try and make it as uh, upbeat and lighthearted as we can. Uh, so, yeah, as ever, you know, chip in and ask your questions as I'm as I'm going through. Yeah, no, I, 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 I guess it can it can seem like a bit of a dull subject. But but my experience in, in the software space is that that buying a new software system in itself doesn't create a huge amount of value for you. What it what it does is it creates the insight. You talk about insight that really does drive value. Um, so 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 it, it's so important with any software system that you get the data side right because that's what really enables you to to drive the value out of out of any system that you put in. Because because without that, hey, there's the, the, pretty much no point doing it yeah absolutely and and I, i'm sure your experience similar to mine as, as we were growing up through industry i'm sure for you same as me you know the we used to make decisions 80 percent based on gut feel and 20 percent based on data and it's recently we've really tried to flip that around and make that 80% about the, the data and the facts and the information that's there. And yeah, there's still a room for the emotive side of that and the 20% and some discussion and feel about what's right. But let's start with a foundation of, of what what the truth is, not what anecdotal feedback might be. So, And, and that's where the, the value comes in because you make better business decisions based on the information that you can see. And this is the foundations of that that we're going to talk about today. Bob, sounds great. Have we got a slide? Yeah, so let's do a bit of screen sharing. To remind everyone that where that everyone is, we've got our um, videos on here. We're seeing lots of people come on here and get download our content, which is great. But you see the videos and you can uh, grab the sort of uh, attachments and, and toolkits that we've been providing on there. So that's um, easily accessible once you get onto the site. And you know the guys remember that the, there's a code there. And today we'll be talking about HR data. And we've got in here the slide pack that I'll be going through today and the data template checker that, again, I'll be uh, walking through at, at, at the end. So let's get our slide where going. So again, I'm not going to go through each of these in lots of de uh, detail because it's more written for you guys to uh, ingest and understand. So I won't be reading from the slide or anything. But as you say, we're on to HR data today, which is the bit about the sort of getting your own house in order and, and seeing the, uh, the things that you can do to make your project a success. You know, HR data is one of those things that can be really straightforward. You know, you might be moving from uh, an existing HR 
system that's already in the cloud to another one, which tends to be um, more straightforward than, let's say, you, you're collecting information on spreadsheets or managing things through uh, a, a local database or you're taking data from your payroll system to, to feed your HR system. So lots of different um challenges within that and it's one of those things that can be really underestimated at the start of a project um, so getting a good view of how your current data um, situation is and where you'll source those kinds of data is is a good way of setting yourself up for success in a project so you know here we are in hr data let's get into the uh, nuts and bolts of it um you um, it won't be a surprise to anyone that um data is now more valuable than oil according to the economists you know you you see the kinds of data that are available you'll have heard all kinds of things about um you know, data being shared and you know the um, legislation around that and data breaches and all these other kinds of things and the so the value of data at the moment is massive um for all the, for all the good reasons for some less good reasons but mainly because of the the sort of power that there is in that data um so yeah and the three things that we're going to just focus on in the, the next uh, several minutes, uh, we'll talk quite a lot about data quality, which we've started about. We'll also touch on data compliance because this is the right sort of place to be starting to think about that. You know, the, you guys will be uh, really familiar with the term GDPR and what that means, uh, but we'll just walk through some of the bits to be aware of uh, around that if you're new to uh, HR systems. Uh, uh, so if you're coming in to do this for the first time, just uh, re-engaging on GDPR is really important and, and obviously the security side of that too. Uh, and then the, the the treat at the end of the journey is the, that data insights piece that we, we just talked about and we'll come on to uh, that in a little bit, bit more detail later on. So as I sort of said earlier, we if you're going to have your new shiny system in the bottom right of the screen here, um, we, we're going to have to feed that with data and you need to understand uh, where you're going to source that data and the scope and scale of what that data might be. So you, it might be really easy for you to provide an HR record as an example. But if you've been doing performance reviews on paper for the last X number of years, how do you intend to do you intend to migrate those into your HR system and how do you intend to do that? So the different shapes of data are also important. Um, you might be, it's easy to think of data as just, um, you know, fields on a spreadsheet. You know, here's column one, column two, column three, column four, but you might also have pictures in there. You might have PDFs in there that you also want to bring into your system. So if you're um, putting different, parts of modules live, then it's important to understand what uh, what we what we mean and where we're going to source those out. So we call this process of moving data from legacy systems to the new system data migration. So that's bringing that data across. And within that process, we, we may just copy the data into the new system or we may have to transform it. And that means change it in a way that makes it fit for the new system. So uh, a good example might be uh, email addresses might be held in your, a database or a spreadsheet somewhere, but your new system might only be able to manage lowercase email addresses. So there might be a transformation job for someone to do within that process to change the data to make it fit for the new system. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I'm, I'm just thinking if you're in a HR um HR world, in terms of historic data within systems, do, do you need to bring the complete history across or, or, or is there something around best practice around bringing so many years or does it depend on what type of data you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And when we come on to the um, GDPR piece in a minute, the, this, this, the retention of data and, and the time that it takes is really important. And there's a, a, a job to do called classify that about classifying your data to say this kind of data needs to be kept for this amount of time. Yeah. Now, uh, and again, you're going to want certain amounts of data for uh, practical business reasons. So um, if someone wants a reference from from you, you know, you're, you, you needed to be able to source their data to understand 
when they worked for you and what information you can pro provide for them uh, and so on across the, the different systems. If you're putting in a workforce management system, for instance, how much scheduling data do you want to uh, retain? Um, you know, seven years is, is fairly, uh, fairly standard for going back for health and safety and legislative questions. But how much of that data do you need to keep for seven years? Because there's a vast array of data in a, in a workforce management system. So uh, um, the, as you go through the different um, types of data that you need to source the, the, the modules or the systems that you're um, putting live, it will drive where you're going to get that data from, e even if it's available. It may not be available. So um, uh, fi finding that and, and sort of creating some rules around that, it, you're absolutely right, really, really important. Um, so, so there'll be a process to go through at the start of a a project to understand those retention periods and we'll come on to that in in, in a second oh yeah um so so excel is the normal um transport mode for uh, the data from old system to new system there's also uh, the possibility of you actually building an integration from your old system to a new system particularly um if you're using a uh to modern technologies, right? So if you are moving from Element Suite away to uh, someone else, not that there's any competitors out there that are any better than Element Suite. <laughs> um, if you were doing that, that'd be potentially worthwhile building an automated process that takes that data across and keeps it up to date. And that's particularly pertinent if you are um, planning on doing what we call a geographical rollout. So let's imagine you've got 500 sites around the country and you want to do the, the southwest first, and then you want to do the southeast, and then you want to do London, and so on and so forth. If you're going to do a geographical road um, rollout, and you have what I'd call a, a transient workforce, as in you know people will move between sites. You know you've got students who work here in the in the uh, summer, and then uh, here when they're in in term time somewhere else when they're in term time. But what you don't want is people moving from old system to new system to old system to new system over a period of time because that will make that transfer of data really difficult. So potentially having a, an integration that keeps those records in check between the two systems and keeps them up to date in the two systems is it's an expensive investment, but it's worthwhile if your rollout is going to take, you know, six months or eight months, depending on what your sort of business change approach is. So, uh, um, so, so if if it's a big bang, then taking a cut of the data, moving it across, and having it ready for go live, all great. And a big bang is where everybody goes live at the same time. If you're going to have a long drawn out process, then it's worth thinking about um, having an, uh, an integration, you know, an automatic file transfer to move that over overnight or, you know, once a week or whatever else to keep those systems uh, in check. Yep, yeah, makes sense. Excellent. Um, sorry, just quickly call out on there. There's, there's a big red line on there, which I didn't uh, shout out, which is about being the data controller. Um, so it, under GDPR, there's um, sort of different, different terminology and data controller is always you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as the uh, people who own that data is a way of, of looking at it. You you are the controller of that data and that gives you specific obligations under GDPR and you need to make sure that that's um, correctly governed. We'll come on to, on to that in a second. So, um, so, so to my point earlier about understanding the scope and size of, of your data, also starting early gives you plenty of time to do what we call, call, call data cleansing. And that's this exercise where you go through and you go, the, the, there's, there's a couple of ways data can be uh, wrong in inverted commas. So it could be inaccurate. So um, my address on the system might be my old address and not my new address. So that is inaccurate data. And then there's um, invalid data. So my postcode uh, should have a space in it and it doesn't, or my national insurance number's missing the uh, final letter off it. So that that's invalid data. So there's two things to bear in mind in, in data cleansing uh, and giving yourself time to review that and have a, an approach to cleanse it is really, really important. So um, it, 
there's a, a few different ways you can handle data cleansing. Inaccuracy of data is probably easiest managed by the person whose data it is. Right. Mm-hmm. So as as my manager's manager's manager or the head of HR the, uh, or the CPO, you're not going to know if Lee um, um, store manager is, um, address is right or wrong. Yeah. Not without speaking to me directly. So it's better for me as the manager to check my own data to see if uh, if it's right or not. Um, so so. The, uh, you can either do that in the source system, so in the, your old systems, or you can wait and be comfortable that you're going to do that in in the new system. Now, if you're, you know, 80, 90 percent sure that your data is pretty good, I'd encourage you to do that in the new system and not worry too much about data accuracy and build that check in into your business change program. So as a as a sort of exciting way of getting everybody onto the system and getting to log on to the first time, go on and check your address and your bank details and all those other things are right uh, to make sure you get paid properly and whatever else. And chances are, you know, these things are going to come across properly, but it's, you know, you don't necessarily then need to check in two places because you also want to check the accuracy of the data migration itself. You know, Lee, Lee's data has come across accurately into Lee's record. Uh, plenty of testing around that, obviously, but you know, the the end user will be the the uh, the one who is the you know absolute guardian of whether their data is correct or not. Uh, and then the other pieces are around. Um, the validity of data. And again, I'll, I'll come on to this sort of toolkit later on um, to sort of show you what the kinds of things you can do to sort of check the, um, the validity of data because invalid data won't load. So, mm. um, you know, you need to make sure that that data is uh, accurate enough uh, from a uh, validity point of view, not from a uh, right or wrong point of view to load into the system. Otherwise, that person's not going to have a record created, which will make them sad. <laughs> um, so a quick um, touch on GDPR, you know, the seven principles laid out in GDPR, lawfulness, fairness and transparency. And this is about the employees data themselves, um, purpose and limita- purpose limitation of that data. So not using it for things that it's not intended for. Um, data minimization is about only holding the data that you need. So, um, you know, you need to be able to prove that there's a valid reason for holding that data. Accuracy, obviously, it's, you know, holding in, in inaccurate data is, is non-compliant. Um, storage limitation, that's about what we were talking about earlier. So how long are you going to retain that data for? And um, what's the process and policy to get rid of it? And again, that will be something that your um, vendor will take you through as you uh, walk through the project, because they'll have a uh, a way of either archiving, anonymizing, or deleting that data according to whatever schedule you lay out. Um, integrity and confidentiality. So that's again about who can see what, um, who can, uh, as a manager, I should only be able to access my employees' data, not the data of manager down the road, and so on and so forth. Um, and then accountability about who who's responsible for making sure that these processes and, and bits are in place. I think the, the important thing on GDPR is for everyone to recognize that it doesn't matter how big or small your organization is, you're accountable for managing this data. And the GDPR is quite Clear, you know. I know you guys have done quite a few posts around around GDPR as the um, sort of days and months have uh, have gone on. So I don't want to dwell on it too much, but as it's always a really important part of your uh, project, and it's important to make sure that you've got some um, views on you know data retention and so on and so forth before you sit down with your uh, your vendor. Yeah, no, I agreed. I I, th- I think for me, a couple of points is. You, you can you can outsource the processing of, of this data right but you can't outsource your regulatory responsibility you are still the controller of this data and it's, it's your responsibility to make sure that you keep up with these seven key principles um and 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 the the the, the subject of, of sars subject access requests come up in on the ninjas forum all the time and actually people have got 
they've got the right to access this data and see what data you hold on them. Um, so so uh, conceivably, if, if data is inaccurate or out of date, um, people can get access to that and, and, and that, that opens you up to regulatory risk as well. So, so super important, this stuff. Yeah, and the other one's the right to be forgotten, which is uh, yeah. always a, a, an important one. So, so as someone leaves the business, they've got the right to, you know, for you to remove their data. So, again, similar along um, recruitment lines. You know, you should be asking an, a, a candidate on recruitment how long you want to retain their application for, and then normally it's a standard. Get are we? Do you want to keep? your record on file for future roles and a lot of people say yes or, and what's the period where we need you to um uh, where we need to delete your your data or do you want us to um remove it straight away because your uh, application has been rejected or whichever way around it might be um so yeah yeah absolutely right on access requests and and that's the other one the the, the right to be forgotten where uh, organizations often get caught out as part of these kinds of implementations yep um so yeah on to com compliance and security more of the same this is about um in, into the detail of of, of gdpr and what pers what is personally identifiable information you know sensitive personal information which you know might not necessarily be personally identifiable but absolutely is really sensitive and other people want wouldn't want you to know about it performance scores and all those other kinds of things that uh, uh, people are rightly emotive about and then non-sensitive uh, information so things that you can access from um the web uh, is obviously uh, uh less um less need to co uh, control it from your perspective but um, most of them fit in those first two categories right and and then so uh, these are i guess our, our four big um takeaways is about the who the how the where and the when so that's about how we manage that data who who can see it who's, who's managing it uh, and so on what the processes are um and how do we get data from x y and z and how is it controlled in, in between um location and processing operations is about where it's um data's held and then the the when so it's about um the the retention password um renewals all these other kinds of uh, bits and pieces that, that come in to the important thing with all of this gdpr stuff is as we say at the top of the slide here having peace of mind that the processes are, are being uh, controlled and the you know the the vendors doing their bit but you as a client are also doing your bit to make sure that um the right people have access to the right information and the, those same people don't have access to the wrong information. Good. Uh, we, uh, and in here we've popped in a few um, links. So again, I'm not gonna go into this in loads of detail, but there's some great um, fact checks and on the CIPD. Um, so we've got a, a link there for you to take you through about you know, what the recommended retention periods are. Uh, and then similarly, the, the, we've got one for um, uh, what your responsibilities are under GDPR. So you as the data controller, what you are responsible for and what a data process is. So that would be your new vendor, what they'll be responsible for and making sure that, you know, all ducks are in a row. Everybody knows what they're um, responsible for, et cetera. So, and then the treat at the end of the uh, of the journey is about data insights. And as we touched on in the introduction, this is really about um, taking that data and doing powerful things with it, smashing it together. You know, we've, I've seen implementations where customers couldn't tell you when you started how many employees they've got, and mm. that's really, really, you know foundational stuff, moving that on to things like employee turnover, starters and leavers, um, uh, recruitment rates, um, you know, mixing that together with um, sales data and whatever else that you can do to say, um, sites who have low turnover have high sales or uh, sites who have high engagement, have high sales, or however you want to prove your business cases of the value of improving things in the HR space, these can be done within the, the systems that you're um, 
you're, you're bringing on, you know, and and really powerfully, how can you have this kind of data at your fingertips and move to a place where, you know, not just the the reports give you value, but dashboards give you value and insights give you value. You know, I've, I I do think insights is a bit of a a, a gold mine. You know, a gold mining operation. You need to. You normally start out with a question, and you go looking for the answer to that question, and you find a really valuable answer to a completely different question. Mm. Um, and uh, that's that's the sort of next stage of, of, of getting on beyond these dashboards, and that's all, all usually uh, manageable either within the product that you're buying or um, w- within a sort of third party tool like Power BI or um, any any one of those. Um, sort of specialist systems. So uh, getting the, the data right in the first stage of this process not only keeps your normal business processes like payroll running the way that you want to, but it also uh, will take you through steps and stages to get to your place where you've got this data at your fingertips and can, you know, sound these off a bit in exec meetings or whatever. When people ask you awkward questions, boom, there you've got the data here. I can share that with you right now. No, yeah, it looks it looks good, and and, and again, the, there's there's re- regulatory requirements for many businesses around this stuff as well. So things like gender gender pay gap, right? And yeah, if, absolutely. If if you can't answer those those regulatory questions, um, you can be in hot water, right? So uh, it's super important that you can get access to this this sort of information. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right, and and these allow you to stay ahead of those kinds of questions, you know, but the, the question about other kinds of diversity reporting or uh, a hot on uh, people's uh, lips at the minute. And, you know, you can start getting yourself a sense of, well, where do I sit on that? What's, what's the, what's the view likely to be? And if reporting comes out, can I start actioning now ahead of the uh, report? Cause I, I want to know where my opportunities are. Mm-hmm. So yes, good shout. Uh, and this is the journey that um, I think um, industry-wide we're heading on, right? So, you know, the transactional HR data is, uh, you know, how many people have started, how many people have finished, and so on and so forth. Reports and uh, are the first example, and these have been around for 50 years, right? How many uh, payroll have been um Booting out reports since since before I started managing, telling telling me how many people I've got and, and and whatever, dashboards and KPIs sit on top of that. So this is having ongoing metrics that report on a regular basis, and then we start to get into the um, last ten years or so where people have moved into predictive analytics and more recently machine learning. Um, so lots of companies, and I I'd encourage you to scratch the surface when people talk about, oh yeah, we've got machine learning and we've got AI and whatever else. Very often that just means that they've got, they've written an algorithm. You know, they've got a bit of code that does some maths and spits you a number out and it's the same bit of code. That's not real um, machine learning. Machine learning is about the, the system understanding the calculation and tweaking the calculation if it thinks or whatever else, you know, that you keep feeding it lots of more data and it understands the data and provides the information out. So machine learning uh, and deep learning. And then next thing, and and, and our CEO, um, uh, Steve Elcox, really keen on this sort of neural network stuff and how do we make machines behave in the way that, um, you, you know, you're, organic brain or work and plug in the right bits of data from around the system and i think you'll be doing a piece on it um for for you guys in in the not too distant future which i'll I'll be happy to to post uh but yeah this that's the sort of future that we're heading towards in this space but i'll drag you right back to the bottom of the tree there from your project's perspective you can't have any of that unless you get the data right and get the data moved correctly securely and it's it's kept um you know, uh, compliantly uh, around GDPR. So the foundations of all of that is getting the data right um, into into your system. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all a bit Terminator, isn't it? And and I think the majority the majority of HR folk that I speak to would be quite happy to have some really great dashboards with some reliable KPIs at this point in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because because people haven't aren't even able, in my experience, to 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 really get to get to 
the, the level that they want just with that stuff, let, yeah. let, let alone getting into the, the, the real heavy AI stuff. Yeah, and, and the value of the AI stuff comes really uh, true in things like workforce management, as an example, yeah. right? So, so you can have predictive analytics that drive you a forecast, but then you have uh, machine learning that says, well, you normally do the schedule like this, and this person doesn't normally like to work with that person, and sales are better when this manager works with this team, and so on and so forth, and it can start thinking about the things that you... Um, you you normally do as part of your your scheduling process and you know the 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 days of um you, me walking into the office as a, a as a, a manager and saying uh, alexa how's the schedule looking next week and alexa says well there's a new event going on on friday that's uh, normally has this impact on sales across other businesses what, what do you think and I, yeah i go yeah put increase my sales projection by um eight percent and there we go, it's all, all taken care of and the schedule tweaks happen and whatever else needs to happen. No, we're not a million miles away from that, uh, you know, as an industry. Um, Brilliant. Well, I, well, I don't want dashboards now, now I want that. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and, and this is a trick, right? Um, you know, the peak companies will sell you on machine learning and deep learning and whatever else. And you'll be really excited and you'll want to go and, and do that right now. But if you haven't got these foundational stuff in place, you can't just jump straight into the top of this tree. You, you've got to build from the bottom up. And, you know, there, there just isn't a shortcut as much as people and companies would like to tell you that there is. Well, one of the key takeaways from this is if you have not got that your transactional HR data right, this stuff won't work, or yeah. it'll get, it'll give you wonky results. And the more um, there's, there's a line from one of the Star Trek films that um, sorry to go all super geek on you, where Scotty the engineer says uh, the more the more sophisticated them they, they make these things, the easier they are to break. And it's absolutely true in the, these these processes. The more sophisticated your algorithms, and the more um, the, the, the cleverer the, the the technology, the easier it is to skew it by feeding it rubbish. Exactly to your yeah. point earlier, you know, I use the American term garbage in, garbage out, just because yeah. it was what I was brought up on. But if you feed it rubbish, you're going to get yeah. rubbish insights, you're going to get rubbish analytics, and you're going to get rubbish suggestions from the system, right? So um, really interesting journey that the industry's going on. Um, don't let people tell you that you can go faster than you can. Make sure you build your foundations now if you're putting a new system in for because uh, it's an investment in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, however long it's going to be. Even if you change systems as we go, uh, you, you go through that journey, you're still going to have a, a, a foundation of strong data and it's going to make that transition to the next system easier if you've cleaned it as you go. So um, re really important to focus on that as part of your project. Great. So um, the other thing we've popped on the website for you is this um, sort of data template checker. This is designed to um, just sort of um, help you validate your data and make sure it's accurate as opposed uh, from a um, validity point of view rather than an accuracy point of view. So back to my uh, address example earlier on. Um, so the idea of this is that you uh, there's a few different tabs in it. One of them you can paste your data into, uh, and then on a separate tab, you'll go through each of these column headings and say what the rules are around that column heading. So the, a date, as an example, on uh, in here might have to be in year, then month, then, then day format, or, or vice versa. So there's a facility there for you to go and sort of set some rules up, and then you're, uh, you'll click the run check button, and it will check every sort of row and every column of that data to make sure that it's valid, and it'll provide you with a little report <coughs> at the end, um, regardless of sort of how many rows it is. You know, if it's tens of thousands of rows, it's going to take a few minutes to run. If it's, you know, it's not too many, it should run fairly quick. But you can see here in the in the example, it's flagging up which columns have got invalid data in it. And we've got a specific report in there as well to tell you um, exactly which uh, cells of data have got um, 
got invalidator in it too. So then you sort of be able to assess from there whether you need to go back into the source system and do some cleaning in the source system, whether you're going to um, do some transformation on it, as we talked about earlier, uh, or, or whether you're going to ignore it. Uh, I wouldn't uh, advise that. So you mentioned, you know, you go through cycles of cleaning your data. So you maybe clean some data in your source system, run it in here, check it, clean it again in your source system, run it in here and check it, and so on and so forth until you get to a place where your data is nice and clean. Right. So I'll put some instructions and I'll put a little video on the site of this running so that you know you guys can see it live in action. So yeah, uh, so that, that's it on on that. Uh, always like to, as I said, I always like to give you a little uh, toolkit to uh, to take away and help you out. It is a bit uh, geeky, but it's really important that one. So it w will help you out uh, a great deal. Yeah, I, I, th I think I think it's tremendously useful. Um, I mean, some some of the ninjas will have. HR, uh, sorry, IT teams with with tools that do this, and that's great. Talk to your IT teams, and if they've got tools that can that can transform your data and cleanse it for you, then great. But but other other ninjas won't, and and a tool like that can can really speed things up and save them a lot of time. So we really appreciate you guys you guys sharing sharing the stuff that you use um, when you're doing your your implementations. That's that's fantastically useful. Yeah, always a pleasure. So yeah, so so that's it on HR data. Hopefully, uh -huh. uh, hopefully added some value for some people's. Um, looking forward to the next one already. Yeah, no, looking forward to it. Um, thanks ever so much for your time and efforts as always, and uh, look forward to catching up with you next time. Awesome. Take care, Paul. Bye, thanks, now. Dave. Bye now.